bienvenidos, buenas tardes. Eh, algunos de ustedes tengo entendido que ya han, han leído o visto parte del discurso con el que Carlos Fuentes inauguró la Cátedra Alfonso Reyes, ¿es así? ¿No? Si no, tal vez lo, lo verán más adelante. Les comento que la Cátedra Alfonso Reyes se fundó hace 20 años exactamente, en febrero del 99, y fue una iniciativa justamente del escritor Carlos Fuentes, quien para honrar a su maestro y amigo Alfonso Reyes, propuso que se fundara una cátedra sobre humanidades, invitando a lo más relevante del pensamiento eh, contemporáneo en diversas partes del mundo, a que vinieran al Tecnológico de Monterrey a hablar sobre literatura, historia, política, religiones, y así hemos tenido la oportunidad de tener pues, a los grandes representantes de la cultura de nuestro mundo. Carlos Fuentes dictó en ese momento, un 16 de febrero del 99, una cátedra a la que llamó, una conferencia a la que llamó eh, los retos, eh, un nuevo pacto social para el siglo XXI. Y es una conferencia de una enorme vigencia. Hoy hemos invitado esta vez a uno de eh, los cómplices en esta aventura de la Cátedra Alfonso Reyes, el profesor David Carrasco, quien ya ha estado con nosotros en varias ocasiones. Ayer dio una magnífica conferencia sobre el mapa de Cuautinchán. Ustedes pueden buscarla ahí, que nos remite al fenómeno de la migración y de las ciudades. Pueden buscarla en live stream y disfrutarla profundamente. Si no estuvieron ayer, voy a comentarles un poco de quién es nuestro invitado de hoy y por qué nos sentimos tan contentos en la Cátedra Alfonso Reyes de estar celebrando este 20 aniversario con su presencia. David Carrasco es historiador de las religiones en la Universidad de Harvard. Él tiene un interés particular en las ciudades mesoamericanas como símbolos y en la frontera de México y Estados Unidos. Sus estudios en la Universidad de Chicago lo inspiraron a trabajar sobre los desafíos de la etnografía y de la teoría postcolonial y sobre las prácticas y la naturaleza simbólica de la violencia ritual en una perspectiva comparativa. Ha trabajado con arqueólogos mexicanos, ha realizado investigaciones en las excavaciones y archivos asociados con los sitios de Teotihuacán y de México Tenochtitlan, que han resultado en sus libros Religions of Mesoamérica, City of Sacrifice y Quetzalcóatl and the Irony of the Empire. Hoy hemos invitado a David Carrasco a hablar sobre uno de sus amigos más entrañables, que es justamente el escritor Carlos Fuentes, con quien sostuvo una amistad eh, personal. Y nos va a hacer una retrospectiva de la vida de Carlos Fuentes, pero particularmente nos va a hablar de las tres caras de Carlos Fuentes. Así es que les pido que recibamos con mucho cariño al profesor David Carrasco, a quien estamos muy orgullosos y contentos de tener en este día. Gracias, David. Gracias. Pues quisiera agradecer um, el TEC de Monterrey y especialmente a la profesora Ana Laura Santa María junto con sus colegas, por esta invitación a contribuir a la Cátedra Alfonso Reyes. Pues, ¿me, ¿Me oyen bien? ¿Sí, ¿todo bien? Uh -huh. Mientras caminaba a esta reunión con ustedes, confronté sentimientos de ambivalencia, duda y esperanza. Ambivalencia porque, por un lado, Conforme me encuentro de nuevo con la carrera internacional y los importantes logros literarios de Alfonso Reyes, me doy cuenta de que honor tan grande es estar aquí y hablar bajo esta sombra gigante, sombra de uno de los más finos tesoros nacionales de México. Por otro lado, este honor se opaca cuando me doy cuenta de que no solo confronto, confronto hoy una, sino dos sombras gigantes que me miran desde arriba en la forma de Alfonso Reyes y Carlos Fuentes. En este momento de duda, recuerdo una historia sobre Bernard 
de Chart en el siglo XII. John de Salisbury escribió en su libro Metodología con Bernard de Chartres solía compararnos a enanos sentados en los hombros de los gigantes. Él señaló que veíamos, veíamos más y más lejos que sus predecesores, no porque tuviéramos una mejor visión o más altura, sino porque estábamos elevados por su estatura gigante. La frase en latín es nanos gigantum, humeris incidentes. Y sugerí que nosotros descubrimos algunas verdad, verdades a través de construir sobre descubrimientos previos. Yo creo que tanto Alfonso Reyes como Carlos Fuentes habrían estado de acuerdo con esa aseveración. Así que esta invitación me ha levantado en los hombros de Reyes y Fuentes, el Rey y la Fuente. Pero mi presentación de hoy no pretende decir que veo más que ellos o más lejos de que ustedes ya ven. I speak to you of the past, of the biography of Carlos Fuentes, of his hospitality, his border crossings, and the psychology of his imagination, which is about what he called shared languages. Perhaps a precursor to what Professor Parra called yesterday translanguaging. In what follows, I want to talk about my Carlos Fuentes and the frontiers he called on me to cross, knowing that some of you admire him for his pushing back against the international ignorance about Mexico's culture and people. He was smart and he was handsome, and we smiled at his magnificent head and head of hair that made him look like, according to Elena Poniatowska, a Mexican lion. One other writer said about him, I described him as a movie star, suave and good looking. His cologne smelled like limes. The hair behind his temples was brushed back. And as I wrote then, said this writer, they looked like small silver wings above his ears. His gray mustache was super groomed. To me, he looked like William Faulkner or Claude Rains in Casablanca. There are many Carlos Fuentes, and in what follows, I will tell three stories about Carlos Fuentes as I knew him that lead into my commentary on the three voices by which I heard him and hear him still. I want to talk about these three voices, three faces and three voices of Carlos Fuentes. Primero, the voice of shared languages, which was a voice he spoke throughout his career as a writer and is very important for us to think about today. Secondly, the voice of the border crosser. Carlos Fuentes, throughout his writings, and especially in the books I'm going to be talking about, constantly was crossing borders, not just geographical borders, but mental borders, psychological borders, because he felt that none of us was really just one thing. We were always many things, and we had to learn to embrace them. And thirdly, I want to talk about his voice of hospitality. When Carlos Fuentes died in May of 2012, two of his books and a photograph of him came to my mind. The first book is his collection of essays called Myself with Others and recounts the many languages he explored, geographical, linguistic, cultural, genre, all languages to him, and the creative connections he made with other writers, countries, cultures, and imaginations. The second book that came to my mind when facing the death of Carlos Fuentes is The Old Gringo, which was the first Mexican novel translated into English to become a bestseller in the United States. It was this book that brought us together, for he came to hear me give a lecture on it in the Novel of the Americas Conference at the University of Colorado in 1990. Learning that like him, 
I had spent part of my youth in Washington, D.C. He came up to me afterward and said generously, David, we have lived parallel lives. Referring to how his father's career had taken him across borders and into contact with many cultures. He had been born in Panama and spent some formative years in Washington, D.C., resulting, he wrote, in his becoming, quote, perhaps the first Mexican to prefer grits to guacamole. I was born near Washington, D.C., to a Mexican father with roots in Bato Pilas, Chihuahua, and an Anglo mother with roots in Kentucky, making me perhaps the first and only Mexican-American to dream that one day the ghost of Pancho Villa and the ghost of Daniel Boone could fight on the same side. His adolescence was more global than mine, than most of ours. For he lived in Chile, Buenos Aires, and Zurich. And these early encounters led him to striving to be a universal writer, a heroic global force. I had lived in Silver Spring, Maryland, El Paso, Texas, and Watts, California. And my encounters led me to think of myself as a mixture of Mexican, Anglo, and African American. In this book, the old gringo, he joined, as I'll show you, his immense skill as a writer with his psychoanalytic vision of the desires and rivalries, love and violence shared by gringos and Mexicans during the Mexican Revolution. This novel is about borders that people cross when they are awake and borders they cross when they are dreaming. Borders crossed consciously and unconsciously. Thirdly, the photograph that I thought about was taken at his home in 1995. And it was shown, it, it was taken the night I escorted the Nobel Prize winner, Tony Morrison, to his home to meet Gabriel Garcia Marquez, another Nobel Prize winner. Fuentes is seated between his best friend, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and his new friend, Tony Morrison. We see Fuentes, the host, but shows him elegantly dressed and with an expression of intrigue and amazement at the scene that he is a part of. So with these three ideas and images in mind, myself with others, the old gringo, and this meeting with Carlos Fuentes, Garcia Marquez, and Tony Morrison, let me tell you my three stories of how I came to hear the voices of Carlos Fuentes and how he aided me in my own intellectual journey. Some years after meeting Carlos Fuentes, and he heard me talk about the old gringo, and several years after the night of this photograph, I called on the voice of Carlos Fuentes when I debated Samuel Huntington, the notorious political scientist, the notorious political scientist Samuel Huntington at Harvard University. Huntington was famous for his book, The Clash of Civilizations, and a major figure at Harvard where I had recently been appointed as the first Mexican-American professor in the 200-year history of the Harvard Divinity School. And uh, this is the way that I got into this debate with Samuel Huntington. I don't know how many of you here have ever heard of or read Samuel Huntington. Some of you know this notorious Harvard professor. So now the way this happened, how I got into this uh, mano a mano with uh, Samuel Huntington was that um, I had a colleague at Harvard at the Divinity School, his name was David Little, and David Little uh, was in ethics and society. And unbeknownst to me, he was a friend of Samuel Huntington's, who, for those of you who don't know Samuel Huntington, was a very conservative political scientist who uh, had contributed to many policies in Washington, D.C. Uh, in support of the Vietnam War. Um, uh, he rose to great fame, this Huntington did at Harvard, through a book that he wrote called The Clash of Civilizations. You see here it was translated into Spanish. And so David Little invited me to dinner one night, uh, but he didn't tell me that Samuel Huntington was also coming to the dinner. And so we got to the dinner and uh, getting to know the other people at the dinner, and we sat down at the table, and all the way down at the other end, I heard this man uh, talking periodically about what he called was Hispanics. But every time he talked about Hispanics, 
uh, there was something, something in the tone and something in what followed the word that made it clear to me that he didn't like Hispanics. Uh, not knowing who it was, I started talking about Latinos because I thought by adding uh, a Latinos to Hispanics, which at that time was seen as a more conservative way of talking about Mexicans in the country, by raising the nose of Latinos, I would put whoever this person was on, on, uh, on notice that uh, you know, I didn't like the tone and the comments that were being made at the other end of the table. But we went through the whole dinner and it was only about halfway through the dinner that I realized that this was the notorious and very famous Samuel Huntington. So what happened is the next day, as I was driving to work, I heard on the radio on NPR, which is the main news station uh, in the United States, I heard um, Samuel Huntington being interviewed. And as he was being interviewed, the interview was to help launch a new book that he'd just written. And the book, was called, the book was called, Who Are We? The Challenges to American Identity and Democracy. Right? And in the interview, I heard him talking about the one chapter in the book that they were using to launch this book. And the chapter in the book was the book in which he attacked Mexicans. And he attacked Mexicans as basically the top of every list of problems in the United States and the bottom of every list of achievements. And I realized I'd sat through this whole dinner with this guy and hadn't really taken him on. Uh, and so I called up David Little. Uh, and I said, uh, David, uh, why didn't you tell me uh, that you were going to invite this, me to dinner and this guy was going to be there? Uh, because me sitting through this without challenging him in a much more direct way, um, as the only you know, Mexican descendant person in the room, uh, makes me now feel like I missed an opportunity. I said, no, we got to do something about this. I mean, uh, now that this book is being launched and it's based upon this anti-Mexican feeling, we got to do something about this, and I want to be part about this. So he said, okay, man, we'll organize it. We'll organize it. And so they organized this, uh, this event at Harvard. Now, you got to understand, at that time, I was a new professor at Harvard. Uh, I didn't have anything like the pull that the great Samuel Huntington had. Uh, but here I was going to take him on in some public situation. And as we got closer... I became a little bit more anxious because I realized, what have I gotten myself into? I'm going up against the great Sam. Um, and so I started asking around to my colleagues in Anthropos, hey, I'm going up against Sam Huntington. I've gotten myself into this. Uh, how should I handle it? And uh, they started warning me. They started saying, oh, man, you got to watch out, man. Sam Huntington, they know about him in D.C. He's real close to Donald Rumsfeld and all those people down there. And if, if, you, uh, you, know, if you bring him down, if you insult him, uh, they may come after you. And I thought, oh, my goodness, what, is, what am I gotten myself into? Um, but, you know, I'm from the University of Chicago. We, weren't, we were taught not to be afraid of anybody intellectually. So uh, then I talked to another colleague of mine, uh, and he said, oh, look, the way you handle Sam Huntington uh, is you, hand, you handle him in that old English way. You know the English way. He said, oh, my good man. I say, oh, my good man, uh, what you say is this, but uh, would you possibly consider another point of view? I said, well, man, I can't do that. That's not my style. I can't do that. <clears throat> So we, we got to the debate, uh, and it was in the biggest room in the Harvard Divinity School, and all the students came out from all over the university. It was a standing room only situation. People were sitting on the floor, uh, and it was a big deal. Uh, and so here I was uh, getting ready to go up against Huntington. And what were his views? Here's the views he presented. His view was that America, the United States, had a series of core values. Very important phrase, core values. That the country itself, its culture, had a core. And this core was now being violated by the appearance of Mexicans and other people of color in the United States. He said there were two basic threats. This is at Harvard University, you understand? There are two basic threats to the core culture. There's an intellectual threat and a cultural threat. The intellectual threat was deconstruction, deconstructionism. A deconstructionism was going to give people a sense of doubting uh, the whole history and the sense of reality in the United States. Um, but multicultural, multicultural America was even a greater threat. Um, uh, and what he said was uh, that uh, these two threats were basically eroding what was American. 
The most dangerous thing was the presence of Mexicans who would erode the core culture by not assimilating to three things, English speaking, Anglo-Saxon thinking, and Protestant working realities. He said that as Mexicans intermarry further with other ethnic groups, this would be a genuine threat to white ethnicity in the United States. Right? There he is. There's Sam, Samuel T. Now, um, there's the book. And this shows you that we now face in the United States a rise of the thinking of Samuel Huntington. Um, <clears throat> So, as I said, he had a series of graphs. And with the graphs that he had, he had all the problems, and the Mexicans were at the top of the problems, and the achievements, Mexicans were at the bottom. So you can see the situation that, in a sense, uh, I was in. Faced with the onslaught of these criticisms, I had read them all before the debate, I turned myself back to Carlos Fuentes and myself with others. I'll return to the debate in a minute, but I want to now go back to Carlos Fuentes and what I'd learned from Carlos that made me more effective that day and tell you what happened. This book came to mind, but it aided me in my critique of Huntington. We are introduced to Fuentes' view, his embracing international literary view, when we simply look at the table of contents of this book, Myself with Others. It's divided into three parts. The first part in Fuentes' book, and I said some of this that day, is called Myself. The second part of the book is called Others. And the third part of the book is called We. Notice how different this vision of himself is than, say, what Octavio Paz gave us in The Labyrinth of Solitude. Fuentes leads the reader on a literary migration through the writings in the book he has chapters on Miguel de Cervantes, the French writer Denis Diderot, the Russian Nikolai Gogol, Luis Buñuel in the Cinema of Freedom, a chapter entitled Borges in Action, another called The Other K, not Kafka, but Milan Kundera, and of course a chapter on Garcia Marquez and the Invention of America. The book ends with a commencement speech that Fuentes gave at Harvard University and it's ironically called a Harvard commencement, that is, a Harvard beginning, appealing to that monumental university where Veritas is claimed but more difficult to find to help Mexico, Latin America, and the U.S. to be friends and not satellites. Fuentes prepared me to face the formidable Sam Huntington in his book's first essay, the first essay in the book is called How I Started to Write. I wonder if any of you have read this. You should all read this essay by Fuentes, How I Started to Write. He tells of his first act of rebellion and as an act of affirmation that even while, like me, he lived as a boy in Washington, D.C., he realized that he was becoming a Mexican. He writes, in 1939... My father took me to see the film at the old RKO Keith Theater in Washington. The movie was called Man of Conquest, and it starred Richard Dix as Sam Houston. You know Houston, Texas. When Dix proclaimed the succession of the Republic of Texas from Mexico, Fuentes tells us when he was 10 years old, I jumped on the theater seat and proclaimed on my own, and from the full height of my nationalist 10 years Viva Mexico, death to the gringos. My embarrassed father hauled me out of the theater, but his pride in me could not resist leaking my first rebellious act to the Washington Star. So I appeared for the first time in a newspaper and became a child celebrity for the acknowledged 10-day span. Everyone shall be famous for at least five minutes. But it was during these years that Fuentes discovered the key not to cosmopolitanism, as some have claimed, but to the source of cultural creativity. He says that, quote, my upbringing taught me that cultures are not isolated and perish when deprived of contact with what is different and challenging. Reading, writing, teaching, learning, 
all are activities aimed at introducing civilizations to each other. No culture, I believed, says Fuentes, unconsciously ever since then, and quite consciously today, retains its identity in isolation. Identity is attained in contact, in contrast, in breakthrough. As a child, he tells us that his breakthrough came through a meeting with the man, the writer whose name echoes in whispers and images throughout this event, Alfonso Reyes. My first contact with literature, he says, was sitting on the knees of Alfonso Reyes when the Mexican writer was ambassador to Brazil in the early 30s. Reyes had brought the Spanish classics back to life for us. He had written the most superb books on Greece. He was the most lucid of literary theoreticians. In fact, he translated all of Western culture into Latin American terms. In the late 40s, he was living in a little house the color of the mame fruit in Cuernavaca. The young Fuentes and his tutor Reyes spent weekends together drinking coffee in cafes. Reyes would, quote, toss verbal bouquets at the girls strolling around the plaza. But the real bouquets was the profound lesson Fuentes learned. He writes of this struggle. He says of his great mentor, Reyes, he could irritate me. That's what we often do with our students. Our students are often irritated with us. He said, he could irritate me. I read against his classical tastes, the most modern, the most strident books. So what he's saying is that Fuentes uh, was reading, uh, he, he'd go reading the books and come and talk to Reyes about it that he knew were going to challenge Reyes uh, and, and maybe scandalize him. So he'd bring the most radical books and say, look, I'm reading this, maestro. The most strident books without understanding that I was learning his lesson. There is no creation without tradition. The new is an inflection on a preceding form. Novelty is always a variation on the past. Bort has said that Reyes wrote the best Spanish prose of our times, says Fuentes. He taught me that culture, I love this line, he taught me that culture had a smile. Sam Huntington, he's never smiled at a Mexican in his life, or Mexican culture. He said that culture had a smile, that the intellectual tradition of the whole world was ours by birthright, and the Mexican literature was important because it was literature, not because it was Mexican. I wanted to know, I wanted to know the secret key to Fuentes' creativity, and he tells us, the secret in a packed list at the end of the essay. Here he reminds me of this idea of learning other languages. Fuentes knows that we now live in a world where creativity depends on, in his words, shared languages. Listen carefully to his list, which is a map tracing the key places and the people of his life with others. He says, I like this picture of the man. Look how handsome he is. Look at him. He's looking at you. I mean, look, look, at, the, look at the confidence of Fuentes. He's so confident. Uh, he, he's deep thinking. Uh, he's dressed up. I dressed up in honor of Carlos Fuentes today myself. <laughs> Listen to this list. This is the end of the essay. This is a list you should include and you should expand on. Neruda, Reyes, Paz. Washington, Santiago de Chile, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Paris, Geneva, Cervantes, Balzac, Rimbaud, Thomas Mann, all only with all the shared languages, those of my places and friends and masters, was I able to approach the fire of literature and ask it for a few sparks. I love that line. Only with all the shared languages, those of my places and friends and masters, was I able to approach the fire of literature and ask it for a few sparks. Now, armed with these golden lessons from Fuentes, I went out to meet the giant Samuel T. Huntington in this public combat at Harvard. I decided in this sitting with him to use the combination of scholarly critique and a sense of humor. 
in my response to Huntington's study and diatribe of American democracy. I chose to critique him by using, in part, my own invented titles for what his book should have been called. His book was, Who Are We? Uh, the Challenge in fa Challenges Facing American Democracy Identity. So when I argued about his notion of the core culture, I suggested that actually anthropology teaches us that cultures are not cores. They're always crossroads. And what comes into the crossroads always changes the core. The core is a dynamic, evolving thing. I mean, just think about what's happened in our lifetimes in our universities. I mean, one of the things that's interesting to me, just as I've been here the last couple days, especially listening to this talk yesterday on translingualism, is how important the word trans is. You know, transculturation, transformation, transgender, translanguishing. We're all in the trans world now. We weren't in that way. We didn't talk that way 10 years ago so much in universities. Things all about trans. And trans is not only about exchanges, it's about exchanges that carry everybody involved in the exchange to a new level of awareness they didn't have before. Not only a new le level of awareness of what they share, but a new level of awareness of who they are. So these type of things are always changing. And so what I said that day against Samuel Huntington's core values is that, look, the United States has always been a place of crossroads. I mean, even the English came here with a, uh, with a, uh, you know, with a migrant language, and that language has changed so much. And so I said to him, instead of calling your book what you called it, you should say, who are we, not a core, but a crossroads. When I argued against his construction of who Latinos are, I said at one point, uh, in, this, we had in the room, as I said, was filled with students and professors, and there was a lot of tension in the room because they'd never seen a Chicano, a Latino, go up against someone like Sam Huntington. And they were like, what's going to happen here? And at one point, I simply said the line to the group and to Huntington. I turned to him, I said, you know, you talk about these Mexicans and these Latinos in your book, and I can tell you I don't know a single person who's like what you say. And at that point in the room, it just exploded with applause because they were so tense for someone to stand up and say, your construction of these people is based upon unreality. So I then said to him, I said, I suggest your book should be called Myself with Others Who Are Like Myself. <laughs> Myself with Others Who Want to Be Like Me. I said, because that's basically what you are arguing for. Professor Huntington, I said, gives ample attention to a list of culinary metaphors <laughs> depicting the nature of assimilation into Anglo-Protestant culture. Now, I don't know how much you're aware of this, but for at least 70 years in the United States, as people have been trying to deal with what happened in American cities, the basic metaphor for trying to describe American culture has been the melting pot. You all heard about the melting pot, right? So the melting pot, uh, was this idea that uh, you, know, you came in with some Irish people, you came in with some English people, uh, you threw a few African-American folks in there, the other people, and they get into this uh, big soup and they just all kind of melt together and they become this American identity. And then people said, no, no, that, that's not too good. Uh, what we need to do is call it a toss salad. They get these uh, silly kinds of things, it's a toss salad. You know? um, a mixing bowl, uh, a weaving machine, a pipeline dumping ground. And so Samuel Huntington, this great professor at Harvard, he comes up and says, you know, I have come up with a new culinary metaphor by which to talk about the core culture. And my culinary metaphor for the U.S. culture is a tomato soup. I can tell you're not impressed either. A tomato soup. He says, an Anglo-Saxon tomato soup. This is what the Harvard professor is saying. And what we're going to do is we throw a little croutons in, we have a little stuff, but it's still an Anglo-Saxon tomato soup. Now, when he said this tomato soup, I knew I had him in the palm of my hand because I know where tomatoes come from. <laughs> and I know where the word tomato comes from. Uh, and he had no idea what he was talking about. This is what he says, just to show you what we're up against. Here's why I'm quoting what he says about this. Immigrants and their descendants that means, that means us in this room. We should duly adopt the standard Anglo-Saxon cultural patterns. The culinary metaphor is an Anglo-Protestant tomato soup to which immigration adds celery, croutons, spices, 
parsley, and other ingredients that enrich and diversify the taste, but which are absorbed into what remains fundamentally tomato soup. So that, I said, as he played into my hands, tomato comes from the Nahuatl term tomato that Cortez and the Spaniards learned in Mexico. Tomatoes were originally cultivated in Peru over 3,000 years ago, migrated to Mexico where it got the name that we use today without even knowing that it's a pre-Hispanic term. In fact, the most handsome men in Aztec society were referred to as Ixquin Tlaxli Ixquin Tomato, something smooth, something like a tomato. I said the Spaniards took the tomato to Europe. It migrated to Italy, where Italians made it their own as pomodoro, the apple of gold. Only much later does the tomato, as word and food, get to Anglo-Saxon lands, where it pretty much drain the whole question of the pomodoro into something that they still eat in England. Only much later, I said. I invoked the song, Sam, you say tomato, I say to model, let's call the whole thing off. I said, your whole metaphor is missing because the better metaphor for US culture today is not tomato soup, it's a Mexican salsa, and I'm going to give you some. <laughs> now, you should know, in terms of my great university, that Samuel Huntington was not the first Harvard professor to think this way, uh, and he's not the last in terms of what it is we're facing and why we have to strengthen, it seems to me, following the kind of work that um, professor, uh, uh, my, my, my professor host is doing here, and that is strengthen the ties between places like Harvard uh, and Tech de Monterrey so we can have more exchanges and learn from one another. You may not know that in the 19th century, Harvard's flagship professor was named Louis Agassiz. He articulated a more cogent and emotional attack on Mexicans because of its mixed race peoples. One day in 1861, while he was walking down Divinity Avenue, which happens to be where my office is today, in a state of anxiety, he was crying. Nathaniel Schaller, who later became a renowned Harvard geologist, asked him why he was crying, and he said, they are going to Mexicanize the United States. And quote, he shuddered at the consequences of mixed races, well mixed anythings. And he told a colleague, can you devise a scheme to rescue the Spaniards of Mexico from their degradation? It was amazing, really, in my debate with Huntington and today in the United States, the words coming out of the Trump administration to hear new versions of all of this, what I heard as a child. There was a saying when I was a child, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, get back. If you're red, you're dead. Only now it's if you're white, you're original. If you're brown, stay down. And if you're black, you don't count. Needless to say, I won the day in my date debate with Sam Huntington, and I had great help from my friend Carlos Fuentes, who let us know that it's really the position of myself with others that we should be developing. Story number two, the voice of the border crosser. Now, the way this happened was also in a personal relationship with Carlos Fuentes. My daughter, Leana, when she was 10 years old, had been with me to Mexico and had been to the Mexican border to where my parents lived in El Paso, Texas. And in those days, when you went to El Paso, Texas, it was very easy to go back and forth across the border to Juarez and back into El Paso. And we used to do it all the time. And of course, when you go through the border crossing in those days, it was you pull up the car when you're coming from Juarez uh, and everybody's kind of tense. Um, and the guy looks in the window and you're supposed to say, American, 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 American. You know? um, and uh, if they don't suspect you, at least in those days, they let you through. Right? Um, so uh, my daughter had gone through this experience a number of times. And um, she knew about my grandparents. My grandparents were born, my grandmother was born in Batopilas, uh, in the ca Canyon de Cobre. Um, came to Chihuahua City when she was 12 on a, on a mule train. 
uh, came to the Mexican border during the Mexican Revolution, met my grandfather there, and started a family. Uh, my daughter knew about that. So she knew about my grandparents crossing. She knew about my father crossing. She'd seen me crossing, and now she had crossed. So in school, she was asked by her, one of the assignments was to write a piece called Historical Fiction. And so what she did is she constructed a single crossing of the four generations, all coming over for the first time. So uh, she as a child was in the car, I was in the car, my father was in the car, my grandparents were in the car. And it was this dr dramatic, tense uh, arrival at the border and how we were going to trick the Border Patrol into letting us all cross the border. Uh, and it was a beautifully written piece. Uh, and just by the nick of time, because uh, the Border Patrol officer was kind of sleepy that day, he lets us through. And all four uh, uh, generations of the Carrascos, who are Mexicans in the story, we make it into the United States. So what happened was, Carlos Fuentes came to town, and we had a dinner together. And I took my daughter. And she told Carlos this story. Uh, and he was very impressed. He said, now this is the way you write, this is the way you write historical fiction. Uh, and I really like this. And so um, he then, a couple years later, published his book called The Crystal Frontier. And in The Crystal Frontier, he's got like eight or nine different novellas. And one of the novellas is called The Rio Bravo, uh, The Rio Grande. And it's dedicated to my daughter because he was so impressed with this particular story. Uh, and it, it takes us into an understanding of Carlos here uh, and uh, the way he thought about border crossing. Now, he wrote the book, The Old Gringo, uh, which I hope you all can read. It's a short novel. It's a powerful novel about Mexicans and, and, uh, and, and gringos, as he calls them in the novel. Um, and it's a novel about machismo. It's about Mexican machismo and gringo machismo. But it's also about a, a woman who gets caught in the middle of all of that. Uh, it's about two gringos who go to Mexico and form a triangular relationship with a Mexican campesino turned general named Tomas Arroyo. I'll give you a little bit of the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the story here. Tomas Arroyo is fighting on the side of Pancho Villa during the Mexican Revolution. Now this meeting between these two gringos, the old gringo and a person known as a gringuita, who's Harriet Winslow, they come to Mexico for different reasons, and they meet. They get caught up in the Mexican Revolution in Chihuahua. Uh, and the revolution there under Pancho Villa is led by this general named Arroyo. This all takes place at a burned-out estate, a a, a burned estate of a Mexican hacienda that had been owned by a family called the Miranda. So you got the Miranda Hacienda, you got General Arroyo, Bajo de Pancho Villa, and you got these two gringos who show up uh, during this time. The two gringos go to Mexico with different goals. The old gringo, who is actually a disguise for a very famous historical figure called Ambrose Bierce. Ambrose Bierce was a writer out of San Francisco, a, a very critical, kind of crusty, sour writer of, of great capacity, who actually in history went to Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, saying that he went there to die and he disappeared, nobody knows whatever happened to him. So Fuentes takes this story, puts it in there, and the old gringo is actually this writer who goes there. The old gringo it actually goes seeking, this is very important to understand Fuentes' insight into a different type of border crossing. The old gringo goes there uh, for a kind of a final male military you know, experience, but he also wants to be killed in Mexico. So he goes there, you know, to be killed. But he has a hidden agenda. It's even hidden from him. And the hidden agenda from him is that he wants to somehow, in the process of being killed, he wants to kill a Mexican who is actually a substitute in his own mind for killing his own father. So it's in his case, his hidden agenda is to have an experience of killing his father. He's not quite aware of it, that's what he's doing, but he becomes aware of it as he kills some Mexicans, that he's really trying to kill his father. Now, the, gring the gringuita, as she's called, Harriet Winslow, she goes from Washington, D.C. This is Fuentes trying to tell you about another type of border crossing. In order to work as a governess and teach English to some Mexican kids, 
at this hacienda. She's been hired by the Mirandas during the revolution. Come down here and teach our kids English and how to be, act like Protestants. Um, but it's really a, a trick by the Mirandas to have her come down and look like everything's normal and they're actually getting ready to escape uh, and get away from the revolution. So she comes down to do that, but she has a hidden agenda. And this is very important in what Fuentes is saying. She's also looking for her father. Now her father, when she was a girl living in Washington, D.C., her father was a military man. You got all these military characters. And she loved her father. And one night her father snuck out of the house and she followed him without him knowing. And she found her father having sex uh, in the basement of a Washington, D.C. abandoned mansion with a black woman. And she overhears the sex, and she overhears the woman say, Captain Winslow, you may have me at your pleasure. Right? Now, she's going to Mexico to help these children, but she's got a hidden agenda that only becomes, she becomes aware of it in the novel. And what she's trying to do in this case is to have sex with a Mexican, dark-skinned Mexican general, replaying the experience of the father with the black woman, only reversing it, so that she can somehow feel that she is recovering this relationship with her father. Fuentes is really doing some amazing stuff here. Okay? So you have these hidden agendas in the novel, in the Mexican Revolution. Um, now, <clears throat> you get this idea of what Fuentes means by frontiers. And he doesn't just mean the physical frontiers. He means the frontiers that get inside of us. So there's a key scene at the beginning of the novel where the old gringo has showed up at the Miranda estate that's being burned up. He, the old gringo is talking to General Arroyo. Now General Arroyo, he's got a hidden agenda. His hidden agenda in the novel is that he discovers that his father is actually Miranda who owns the estate. And the father had raped one of the Campesina women. And he's the fruit of that. And he's going to the revolution. His life in the revolution is to get back at his father, but he also wants to have a relationship with a woman that he can identify as his mother. Now this is hidden to him as well. It's only revealed to us in the writing of Carlos Fuentes. So you got these three agendas that are really something. And what happens is, in the beginning, where, where you know that Fuentes is trying to get us in below the surface, they all meet in this, in this uh, train, this fancy car, train car. And the old gringo is there, Harriet Winslow is there, and General Arroyo is there. And here is what is said. The three protagonists, the old gringo, the gringuita, and Thomas Arroyo are together, and Fuentes writes, and the frontier in here, the North American woman has asked, tapping her forehead, and the frontier in here, General Arroyo has responded, touching his heart, there's one frontier we only dare to cross at night. The old gringo said, the frontier of our differences with others our battles with ourselves. Now, in my reading of the old gringo, the two most important border crossings are found in the stories of the bodies of the Mexicans and in the unconscious desire of the three main protagonists. Fuentes dazzles the reader with his ability to describe a single body as a place where there's been all these crossings. A single body and it's that of Pancho Villa in such a way that it comes to represent the entire history of race mixtures in Mexico. And let me read this to you. If I can find it here. Hold it. Come into it. Come into it. Hold on. Here it is. Pancho Villa makes a, an appearance very late in the novel, but he appears in a luminous, in a luminous entrance, almost as if he is a god appearing in Chihuahua. Listen to this passage to get this idea of border crossings into the Mexican body itself 
that is more than just something that's physical. This is Carlos Fuentes at his best. Pancho Villa rode into Camargo one brilliant spring morning. His copper hard head was crowned by a large gold embroidered sombrero, a sombrero stained with dust and blood, not a luxury but an instrument of power and a symbol of struggle like his wide calloused hands and his bronze stirrups buffed by the mountain winds, a patina of gunpowder, thorn and rock, pine trails and endless blinding plains clung to his rough antelope colored suit, his chamois leggings, his steel machete and his silver parade goad, the gold and silver buttons on his short jacket and trousers, everything gleaming with silver and gold not precious treasures to be hoarded, but medals to adorn us in battle and in death, a suit of lights. Now this is the part. Villa, and maybe this is like some of us, Villa was a man of the north, tall and robust, his torso longer than his short Indian legs, but with long arms and powerful hands, and a head that might have been lopped long ago from the body of another man in former times, and distant places, a severed head from the past, welded like a precious metal cask to a mortal body, powerful but powerless from the present. Oriental eyes, smiling but cruel, set in a plane of laugh lines, a ready smile, teeth shining like kernels of white corn, a scrawny mustache and three days growth of beard. Now listen to this, a head that had been seen in Mongolia and Andalusia and the Rif among the nomadic tribes of North America and was now here in Camargo, Chihuahua, grinning and blinking and squinting against the onslaught of the light, a head stored with vast reserves of intuition and ferocity and generosity, a head come to rest on the shoulders of Pancho Villa. To me, Villa is depicted as a synthesis of migrations from the borders of China and Russia, from Spain, from indigenous America. For Fuentes, he's a kind of quintessential Mexican, the profound border crosser. Fuentes goes deeper into those nighttime border crossers in a single scene. So what happens is, in the novel, there's a single scene. I won't read it because time is passing and we want to make sure we have time for the next presentation. There's a single scene. What, what Carlos Fuentes has done in this novel is he has staged the development of the novel in a series of particular spaces. One is the railroad car, which I already gave you a, a passage. But the second is the Miranda estate. Everything is burned in this Mexican estate except one room. It's the ballroom. And the reason they don't burn the ballroom is because the ballroom is a miniature Versailles. And when you go to Versailles, all the walls have these incredible mirrors there. So what Fuentes does is he constructs the Miranda estate with this ballroom and there's all these mirrors. And the reason that the Mexican general does not burn the ballroom is because he wants the Mexican people to come into the ballroom and for the very first time in their lives, see their full bodies in a mirror. Because these people who work in the fields, these people who are in the revolution, they've never seen themselves full bodied in a mirror. And so you have this incredible scene where they come in and they see themselves and they say, is that me? Is that you? Is that us? And so Miranda has left this alive in, in Fuentes' writing. Now, this kind of place in a novel is what we in anthropology call a liminal space. A liminal space is a space that's in betwixt and in between who you used to be and who you're going to be. It's where you've separated yourself from a certain awareness or a certain type of identity and you come into this space and in this space, things happen that are potential. Uh, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're in the position of the subjunctive. They're in the position of this might be, could it be, will it be, this possibility. And so what Fuentes does is he creates this space. And in this space, there's a dance. These people are dancing for the first time in front of the mirrors. And in the dance, the General Arroyo, who's very dark skinned, by the way, and the Gringuita, they're dancing and they're starting to warm up to one another. They're starting to get tight. Uh, they're starting to get sexy. They're starting to feel like something's going to happen here. And as he writes this thing that's happening here, what he, has a, what he says is that as she 
is feeling very close to this dark-skinned Mexican, she realizes, she becomes aware, somewhere in the back of her mind, that on the one hand, she's dancing with her father, and she buries her face in the neck of the general, the dark-skinned Mexican, and she whispers to herself what she heard her father say to the black woman years before, you may have me at your pleasure, Captain Winslow. And she begins to realize that in her mind, she's not only dancing with this Mexican, she's transferring to this Mexican these feelings about her father long ago. Huh. At the same time, Fuentes writes it, the general is dancing with her. And he starts to get very close. And as a matter of fact, there's a description of her body underneath her clothes. And she, he begins to think, I'm really dancing with my mother. I'm dancing with my mother who was pure, who was not violated before. But now I'm going to do the violation. I'm going to take care. I'm going to cross the border between my relationship with my mother who was injured and this woman who I'm going to injure. Although I'm going to show her great pleasure, but I'm going to injure her. And the two of them are having what Freud and Jung call the transference. A transference is where you take something from childhood, some painful, powerful experience, which has become kind of hidden in you. And you displace those feelings onto a person later when you're adult life. And you become very tight and involved with that person, but you don't realize that the person you're relating to is not only that person, it's this person in your past. And so Fuentes has done this in the old gringo. He's put this border crossing, not only between the United States and Mexico, but not only between all the things that happen to the Mexican body, where all of these forces have come in, but he's trying to say, in order to understand us as Mexicans, as people in the revolution, what we also have to know is that we have these deep psychological resources. And if we're not aware of them, we're going to be bring into the contemporary situation unresolved feelings and so forth from the past. Captain Winslow, you may have me at your pleasure. And indeed, they go on and have a lot of pleasure, but I'm not going to go into that description. Uh, you can go read it. It gets a little bit into uh, just the edge of pornography, uh, which I don't want to bring in here. But Fuentes is very interested in using sexuality as a border crossing technique, but also his attention to Freud and other writings on psychoanalysis are part of this novel. One interviewer said to Carlos Fuentes, I asked him about his writerly fascination with sex. Sex, Fuentes said, as anything else in life, is an avenue to literature. Without literature, it would have no meaning. I don't know about that. I'm a literary animal. For me, everything ends in literature. The third voice and the final voice that I want to tell you about is Carlos Fuentes and the voice of hospitality. When I was on the faculty at Princeton University, I had the astonishing good fortune to become, uh, to work with Toni Morrison. How many here have ever read a novel by Toni Morrison? Anybody know Toni Morrison? Toni Morrison is the first African-American woman to win the Nobel Prize in literature. And uh, when I went to Princeton, uh, I had a chance to work with Toni Morrison, and we became friends. Um, and we became friends in part um, because uh, she asked me to do some research for her uh, in her novel, Paradise. And I was writing my own book called City of Sacrifice about Aztec ritual killings, and Morrison saw a parallel in her own study of how the social construction of others as alien, dangerous, and foreign uh, was part of white racism uh, in the United States. Um, and so I invited Toni Morrison to come to Mexico uh, to see the racial world of Mexico as well as the archaeological uh, work that I was doing. I've been working for 30 years at the Templo Mayor in Mexico City with Eduardo Matos Moctezuma. We've done a number of projects. And so I wanted to take Toni Morrison there uh, to see this. And, um, she, she accepted. And this was a big deal to take a Nobel Prize winner to Mexico for the first time. Um, and uh, right about a month before we left, I got a phone call and she said, look, I, I want to go, but I want to know if I only have one request. And I said, what's the request? And she said, well, the request is, now, can I meet Garcia Marquez? And I said, sure. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'll arrange it. Uh, and then I hung up and I realized, I don't know Garcia Marquez. What am I saying? I, uh, you know, but I, uh, the reason I said it was I didn't want her to back out. I, you know, maybe she'd, she'd won the Nobel Prize, all kinds of things happened. She might say, well, we'll go next summer when you can arrange it. So I said, sure, I, I, can, I can do that. Um, and uh, so I, in my desperation, I called up Carlos Fuentes. Uh, and I said, Carlos, sabes que, you know, um, you know, I, Tony Morrison wants to come, but she wants to beat Garcia Marquez. And he said, David, you're in luck. Gabo is my best friend, and we'll have dinner at my house in Mexico City. And we did. Uh, and here you see, I think, Carlos Fuentes uh, also at his best. Uh, here's Carlos Fuentes uh, sitting next to Tony Morrison. Um, uh, this is uh, Garcia Marquez uh, here. Uh, this is Mercedes Barcha, who is Garcia Marquez, was Garcia Marquez's wife. This is Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, the great excavator. Silvia Lemus, uh, which is uh, Carlos Fuentes' wife. Um, uh, this is Ford Morrison, Tony Morrison's son. This is Maria Luisa Franco, who's translating. Uh, this is Carlos Fuentes' daughter. Uh, aquí está su servidor. Um, and um, in this situation, uh, amazing things happened. And here we see... Uh, is to me the face of Carlos Fuentes and hospitality. Take a look again at this particular picture. This is now a very famous picture. Um, it's going to appear in a movie uh, that is uh, going to be shown, uh, I think worldwide, but certainly in the United States in theaters this summer, called Tony Morris and the Faces I Am. Uh, take a look at the three of them. Um, Garcia Marquez is on the left. He looks as though a Hindu god is emerging from his head. Uh, and he projects a very romantic gaze in Morrison's direction. Morrison is frozen in a moment of storytelling with a gesture that reminds me of how shamanesses weave a myth into the minds of listeners. And Carlos Fuentes is in the middle of the exchange. And he seems to me immensely pleased to be in the company of Morrison, giving her his full attention at his home uh, in Mexico City. So for me, Carlos Fuentes was the whole package. That's the real secret of his fame and his significance. He was a great writer of novels. He was a fine essayist, a university professor, a dashing diplomat, a critic of governments. He was also the best public speaker of all the Latin American writers. This combination of talents led him to becoming a living symbol and a widespread communicator of the literary creativity of Latin America. Even though he did not win the Nobel Prize, and I think he should have, six Latin American writers won Nobel Prizes for literature associated with the Latin American boom. And it can be argued that it was Fuentes' literary brilliance and personal charisma that helped push back some of the world's ignorance and sometimes disdain for Latin Americans and their imaginations. He could speak in English and French with the same eloquence and power with which he spoke and wrote Spanish. I remember a lecture that he gave in 1992 at the University of Colorado on the geography of the novel in Latin America. His talk was full, this really impressed me, his talk was full of your names, of Latin American names. He filled the ears of 1,500 people with new accents and the literary lineages of the future. What was really powerful to me is he, he, he not only talked about Latin American literature, but he kept dropping the names of Latin Americans, of, of Mexican writers, of Cuban writers, of Argentine writers. He didn't have to do that. He could have talked all about the, the meanings uh, and the theories and the book titles, and he did that too. But he overloaded it with names. And to me, sitting in this audience, which was largely Anglo, it really impressed me that these names were so important. He wasn't simply dropping the names. He had read them and known them. And he was trying to say to that audience, prepare yourself for the accents and the names that are coming out of Latin America because they're a part of our future. Fuentes loved being with others because he drew energy from their words. Here's another photograph later that night. And you can see him here on the couch with Toni Morrison and Garcia Marquez. He drew energy from their words and the faces, and he enjoyed dazzling people with his language and imagination. 
But when people call him cosmopolitan, they miss the point that he repeatedly made about the trauma of frontiers. How European dreams became destructions in Latin America that also resulted in the most original and urgent creativity. This is what he was trying to say. He was saying, don't call me a cosmopolitan. In Latin America, there was these tragic encounters. But out of these tragic encounters, some people have been able to find new resources. And they're trying to make resources that could only have been created out of this tragic encounter and take these resources and try to build a new world. That's what Fuentes is trying to say, that the most urgent and original creativity of cultural exchange took place in Mexico, in the Caribbean. He said, in Latin America, we have to imagine the past and remember the future, reversing the conventional formula. Imagination was crucial because cultures, library, lineages, and peoples were damaged. Their languages were damaged. Memory is not enough, he said. As he wrote in the book, This I Believe, an A to Z for the life, the long drive to the globalized world was made up not of cosmopolitanisms, but a multiplicity of encounters between the indigenous, the European, and the African. Carlos Fuentes and I spoke just prior to Toni Morrison's 80th birthday some years ago. I had been asked to give one of the tributes for Toni, and I called Carlos to ask if he wished to send a word of greeting in memory of that dinner years ago. He said, I've just turned 80, David, and tell Tony that the 80s are the best decade. After all, we're still alive and loving it. He preferred to be surprised by death rather than suffer in decline, embracing the pure pleasure of being alive, soaking life in as a participant and not as an observer. He passed away in Mexico City, a city which he, which he wrote was built in the true image of gigantic heaven. And because of the way he believed, we hope that his spirit has ample room to roam, always to others. Now, let me tell you a final story, then I'll close, about Carlos Fuentes and his death. Soon after he died, my wife, Maria Luisa Parra, and I, we went to Paris because we had been told that he was buried in the Montparnasse Cemetery. And we wanted to go there and pay homage to Carlos Fuentes. Now, in this cemetery, you have buried people like Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. Carpentier is buried there. Emile Durkheim is buried there. Max Weber is buried there. Porfirio Diaz is buried there. And when we got there, we were looking for Carlos Fuentes' grave, and the gravekeeper there told us, oh, no, he's not here anymore. He was taken, and he was moved somewhere else. And we were totally disappointed not to be able to find the grave of Carlos Fuentes. When he came back here, we communicated with Silvio Lemos, his wife, and she said, no, it's not true. He's there. No. He's there, but you just didn't find him there. But, you know, I like to see, think of him in many places, not just in that cemetery. I like to think of him, you know, where wherever he has his literature, wherever we hear him, wherever we remember him. And, uh, you know, it's, it's in, in that way that I, that I want, want to end. Um, he was asked one time by this same, um, the same writer um, what he would like to have written on his tombstone. Um, and the writer describes that Puentes did not want to answer that. But uh, as Fuentes got out of the taxi and walked away, he turned around and said to the interviewer, that's just too deep for me. And that's Carlos Fuentes. He's too deep for all of us. And it's deep being here with you. And I thank you very much for your attention.